Okay. Welcome to New York Buddha Dharma, everybody. Um, my name, in case you don't know me, is C.T. Tamora. And uh, today we're going to talk about encountering problems uh, with meditation practice. Um, it's actually chapter 29 in this book, here entitled The Path to Individual Liberation by Chogyam Trungpa also known as the Ocean of Dharma, the profound treasury of the Ocean of Dharma. Um, and what I thought we would do is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the problems that Chogyam Trungpa mentions, um, and some very common problems that we run into. And I think regardless of whether you've been meditating for, you know, if this is your first day meditating, or if you've been meditating for 40 years, like we all run into obstacles with our meditation. So um, I want to chat a little bit about these, then maybe talk a little bit, um, have a discussion about problems that we are personally encountering in our meditation practice, and then maybe some ways, present uh, ways to, to work with those obstacles. Um, and I think too, because we have so many experienced meditators here today, it's always great to hear from from other people as well about how you handle obstacles that have come up in meditation. I think the obstacles, in some ways, they change as our meditation practice changes, but in some ways, they kind of stay the same too. They just they just kind of take on different facets, different different uh, different faces. I feel like as as our meditation progresses, as our practice progresses. So, with that in mind. Encountering problems. So common obstacles, the first thing Chagam Chungpa talks about is lack of commitment. And what he says is great. He says, the need for commitment does not mean that you have to join the party, peri, party politics of Buddhism. It means that you need to make a commitment to yourself. And he, what he's talking about is he's not saying you have to commit and be like, oh, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist, I'm, I'm this, I'm a serious practitioner. It means committing to the practice and, and, and saying, yes, I am going to make a practice of this. I, I always like to compare meditation practice to, uh, to working out, which I know something is Chogun Trumpa apparently did not like at all. But... But I think that there are the similarities because it's a very common, you know, this in this day and age, the, the idea of having a, a, a workout routine, of having a practice of, of conditioning our bodies is a very good parallel that a lot of people can relate to when it comes to having a, a, a practice of mind, you know, and conditioning our minds. And it's kind of like, well, if you're going to commit to get into shape, you know, if you, you, you're going to commit to having a practice on a regular basis, you're going to commit to to running three days a week and stretching and doing yoga the other two or three days a week. Or you're gonna, you're gonna commit to going to the gym, you know? We all come, like January comes, you know, and we're all like, all right, I'm gonna commit to my, my workout regimen. And I think that's what he's saying here is, is, is one of the big obstacles. It's actually just committing to doing the practice. And, and not, not just committing to sitting on a cushion for 20 minutes a day, uh, you know, seven days a week or whatever it is, but also committing to, to um, sitting and practicing meditation, which as we kind of already know, if you have a meditation practice, that this is, this is a, an active thing. You know, we, we think that when, when we're starting out, we see people meditating and, and we, we see them just sitting and we're like, oh, they're sitting doing nothing. You're just, meditation practice is about sitting and just being still and focusing on your breath. But there's a lot more to it, right? We kind of, we're, we sit and then we work with our technique. We sit and we work with the technique of, of having a light attention on our breath and a greater awareness of the space and becoming aware of when our minds are sort of hijacking our attention and running off with them. When we're telling stories in our head, where the act of meditation is to notice that, let it go and bring our attention back to the breath, back to the present. And, and that action, that's, that's meditation in action, right? That is the act of meditating. That is part of that practice that we're committing to. And much like, 
you know, committing to doing a, a series of exercises, that's what we're doing by committing to sit down and work with the breath and work with our awareness and our attention. So, um, he says, if there's no ambition, no real commitment, all kinds of entertainment come up in our mind and you're hardly sitting at all. Your mind is miles away in your own private movie show and you encourage that because it is entertaining. And I think, you know, sort of the same thing. It's, he's just saying, you know, if, you, if, there's no, there, there, if there's no discipline, if there's no intent to actually sit and work with our minds, then what are we doing? We're just sitting still for 20 minutes. That's very different from sitting and meditating for, for 20 minutes. And we have to commit to that. We may have to say, this is what I'm here to do. Um, it kind of reminds me, too, of, of one of my favorite little things that I, I like to say to myself when I sit to meditate, especially if I'm feeling speedy and neurotic, if I've had a busy day or I have a busy day ahead of me. You know, I always, I, I don't know if you guys have ever sat and, and tried to, and you're sitting there and you're sitting, okay, I'm going to meditate now. And, you know, and you're sitting there and next thing you know, you're kind of thinking, it's like, man, I got, I got all this work to do. It's like, oh, I forgot, I forgot to put this thing on my calendar. I've got to remember to do that at the end of my practice. And like, oh, I've got, and, and you know, next thing you know, your mind is running away with you. And I like to, I don't do it as consciously these days, but I, for a long time, what I would do is I would sit and I would say, Okay, for the next 20 minutes or the next five minutes or the next 40 minutes, whatever amount of time that I've allotted to sit, I'm going to give myself the, I'm going to give myself the permission to not worry about what I've got to do later on today. I'm giving myself the permission to sit and just focus on my practice, to just sit and be present, to focus on my breath, be aware of the present. And, and I find that, like, you know, there may be times, uh, there may be a time when you get, you sit down and you, and you, uh, um, you realize, oh, I forgot, I have to be somewhere in 30 minutes and I have to leave now, you know? Okay, so that might not be the time to sit and meditate for 20 minutes if you can't get, get there, uh, get to whatever it is you're supposed to be doing. But the idea is, is that, if you have the time to sit and meditate for whatever period of time you have, allow yourself to just do that practice. Allow yourself to worry about all this, the other things later. All your anxieties, all, all your, like, the things that you're worried about, I guarantee will be right there at the end of your meditation practice waiting for you, you know? So in that time, for that allotted time, just let, just let, let them go and just focus on the practice. And I, I, I always resonate with that when I, when I read this stuff. So uh, another problem that uh, he talks about is lack of synchronization. In meditation practice, you're working not only with your mind, you're working with your breath and your mind, your body and your mind. You never leave reality. That is the idea of Xinjiang, the ideal state of tranquility in shamatha. Um, the... I mean, this is what we're talking about, right? It's, it's actually the, the, the fact that you are, it's a practice of body and mind. Um, like we were talking about, focusing on the breath, a light attention on the breath, a greater awareness of the space. You know, without that focus on the, the breath and the body, we, well, there's different practices, but, you know, this is the, the practice that we're, we're teaching, which is a, uh, a shamatha vipassana hybrid, a, a mindfulness awareness practice. And that mindfulness is very helpful uh, focused on the breath, focused on the body, the feelings of the body. And if we think about how we experience awareness of the present, it's through our senses, through, through our five senses and through our mind sense, right? Through, through mental objects. So, so this is, you know, the work. Again, this is sort of the... the the practice and and we have to have our mind and body in sync in order to be able to practice right you can't which is interesting I, I feel like if you ever have noticed when you sit down and, and meditate you sit down and meditate you can be really uh sort of uptight uh you can be kind of you know 
speedy and, and, and anxious about whatever you've been worrying about up until that point, you can't, it's, it's, it's almost like the, the, the mind and body naturally want to synchronize, right? If you calm your body down, if you focus on the breath, calm your body down, your mind has a tendency to follow that, right? And, and it's sort of true, the other part is true as well. If you're able to sit down and relax your mind, right, which is part of the reason why I, I like coming up with that, reminding myself, okay, for the next 20 minutes, I don't have to worry about it. I give myself permission to let go of those things. Let me relax my mind. And as I relax my mind, my body tends to follow suit too. Um, yeah. So he, he says, this is important. If you are untrained in synchronizing mind, breath, and body, you find lots of problems. Your body wants to slump and your mind is somewhere else. And I think what he's pointing to here is that you need some training, right? He's, you need some training in the practice of meditation. You need somebody to explain to you what you're supposed to be doing. You need somebody to, be, to, to give you anecdotes or to give you, um, you know, practices, ways, techniques of labeling your thoughts as thinking, letting them go and bringing your attention back to the breath. Otherwise, we're just sitting and we're like making sure we don't move, right? Which is very different than meditating. Um, so this is an interesting thing. He's just talking about posture slumping. Um, and he goes on to say that the combination of your breathing and posture provides your mind with a reference point. By checking back to that reference point, it can correct each situation properly. And um, there is a correspondence between posture and presence, right? Our, if, we are, if we're slumped over, which we know is not the greatest posture and certainly not the way we instruct uh, meditation posture, there's a very good chance that your mind and your attention has, is not on what's happening in your body at that moment. Because if it is, you would actually notice and straighten up your posture. And I had a friend, uh, he, was a, he lived in a Zen uh, monastery for uh, a couple of years, and he told me very early on, he was like, you know, um, your posture kind of informs where you are with your practice in some ways. And I always thought that was interesting. And this is years ago, and I, I, what I did is I started um, videotaping myself meditating. Uh, this is part of a bigger thing, the sitting project, which is the, the website that I that I started about meditation, I thought it would be good to, to show regular people meditating uh, it, at home, you know, in private, in public, wherever, but just to kind of help normalize meditation. And, and um, one of the things that I noticed when I watched the first few videos of me meditating was that as time went on, I would slump, right? And then, I'd, then I would notice and I would, I would come right back. And, and I, I found that very interesting because I know that, you know, you, we've, I'm sure if you've all here meditated, then you've all had this experience, right? You're like, you're meditating, you're meditating, your mind starts wandering. Next thing you know, you're slumped over and you're like, oh, oh, I gotta, I gotta get back to my, to my proper posture, right? And there's, there's that correspondence of awareness, you know, awareness of the present, so... So the, the, again, that, that's a body-mind synchronization thing. It's both indicative of the synchronization of our body and mind and also like a little signpost, like, oh, well, let me check back in with my posture. And he goes on to talk about, I think it's here, um, or it might be later in the chapter, he talks about how every breath is an opportunity to fix your pro posture. You know, and I, I, would, I would suggest to you, you know, Certainly, if you notice that your posture has changed while you're sitting in meditation, you can just correct it and sit up. Um, but I also have noticed when I, when I read this, I realized that what I, what I would try to do sometimes, and especially I noticed this again when I was, when I was uh, videotaping med people meditating, including myself, I would try to adjust my posture. When I noticed my posture had kind of changed and I started to slump, I would kind of use the natural movement of my breath to, to slowly adjust my posture back. And there's no like, this is not like a, this, you know, this is not a special thing. This is not a super important thing. 
but there is a you have an opportunity to not just react in terms of like oh my posture is bad i've got to fix my posture you have the opportunity to say okay let me bring my posture back to being erect but i don't have to in a way right you don't have to react to it habitually or 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 the way that you you're where you're sort of like kind of like admonishing yourself in your head it's like oh i've got bad posture i've got to fix it allow yourself try like if you ever notice try to just allow yourself to come back into a posture that is in a, in a gentle kind of way use the breath each breath as an opportunity to check back in with your posture you know so um another thing he talks about the beckoning of sense perceptions he says it makes you completely cranky um he's i should say when you begin to get tired of your sitting practice you entertain yourself by using the last exit you have visual and auditory sensations overusing the sense organs in that way is problematic it makes you completely cranky the speed involved with seeing or listening gives you insomnia you are so hyped up that you become like a little child who is put to bed too late and becomes neurotic and cries a lot and destroys things. So, um, it, the, the way I like to, to think about this is there's, um, when we use our brains, right? So, so one of the ha things that happens is we, we're naturally, like our minds are used to like focusing in on, on something and then analyzing it and thinking about it, thinking a lot about it, right? We like to latch on to things and think about them. And, and in this way, kind of what he's saying is that's sort of what makes us tired. It's sort of what creates neurosis. It's kind of what, it's what creates anxiety, this constant desire for us to latch on to something and think about it, think about it a lot, you know? And what we're, what we're trying to do in this practice is to, is to not get caught up in that sort of anxious grabbing onto thoughts and letting go of those thoughts. Right? And, and, and as we do, it's, there's a sense of relaxation that happens. There's a, it's, it's, there's a, sense of, a sense of spaciousness that occurs. Right? And, and as we learn, as we practice letting go of these neurotic thoughts, these, these active minds, this like, whoa, what, what does it feel like right now? Is it hot? Like, uh, do I like the feedback that's going on in the microphone? Like, whatever, whatever it is, what I hear, what I see, there's two ways to experience that. We can kind of experience that in an open and relaxed way, or we can latch on to individual parts of what we're experiencing and analyze them. That, that kind of latching on and analyzing things is really tiresome. It's, it, it creates this, this neurosis that we, that we deal with in life. So what we're trying to do is to relax that. We're trying to, to, to experience the sensations that we're having not as not as in, as components we're not trying to focus in on a component of it we're trying to experience them as a whole i i really like the idea that you you if you use your hearing as an example right like right now okay you can if you focus your attention on your hearing you're hearing my voice you're hearing you know uh some some air conditioner outside and drips and you're hearing maybe you know whatever it is you can focus in on analyze that i was like well when i'm even just describing it to you i'm fo i'm like focusing in and trying to analyze well what is that because we turn the ac off so there's like another ac out there that's obviously making this noise and there's dripping i think that's causing these things to sound like cracks whatever it is and suddenly i'm just lost in neurotic thought about what i'm hearing and the moment i start having that conversation with myself about all these things that I'm hearing, I'm not actually really hearing <laughs> what's going on. I'm, I'm suddenly lost in thought. So, so what I'd like, I'd like to describe it as what we're trying to do when we're experiencing, for example, our hearing, is we're trying to hear everything that's happening right now as a, almost like a symphony. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, all, it's all one, it all goes together. It's all the experience of our hearing we're not trying to single out any of the instruments in the symphony, which is what we do if we focus in on uh, a drip or a mechanical sound or a creak or the sound of our breath or whatever it is. 
We're trying to actually let go of those, of those kinds of our mind wanting to latch on to our hearing. And we're trying to actually open it and relax it and experiencing our hearing as a whole. Does that make sense? And then if we do that, we can do that with all of our senses. We can do that with our vision. We can do that with our hearing, our smell, taste, the whole thing, our fe- the feeling of our bodies, right? We're trying to not focus just on, okay, well, there's the feeling of the breath, and that's the only, that's the only thing. I, I kind of want to be able to experience the feeling of our bodies as they exist in the space, experience our hearing and our sight as it's happening. And, and it's very hard, I don't know, it's very hard to, it's, it's fairly, I wanna say it's easier, right, to, to focus on one sense, right? It, if we close our eyes, we can do it right now. And why don't, why don't we all try it? Let's close our eyes and let's just, let's just place our attention on our hearing. And everything that you're hearing, it's an all-inclusive thing. And you'll notice that you're gonna focus on one thing or another, or things are gonna jump out at you as you sit in and try to experience your hearing. But see if you can, rather than latching on to trying to describe to yourself what you're hearing, try not to describe to yourself what you're hearing and just hear it. And try that for a minute. We like to single things out. But the truth is, is that the way we experience our hearing is all connected. It's all the same stuff that we're hearing. So, and then you can Come back, open your eyes again. I, I certainly, I think it's a great practice to actually go through the senses and, and try that with the different senses. Um, but the, the key there is, is what we were talking about, which is as we open, as we relax into the present, our experiences are able to widen and open up as opposed to being focused in on something in particular. And that actually is good for our minds. It's good, a, a, a rest for our minds. Um, I'll just read this too. If you have good head and shoulders, which is good posture, and your visual field should be somewhat dissolved. As you look out, relax your eye muscles. Don't try to make visual perception sharp and clear. Open your eyes and diffuse your vision. It's kind of saying the same thing, right? When you're with this eyes open meditation, we're the, you know, keeping our gaze somewhat downward, 45 degrees, let's say. I can sit and I can focus on the black marks of the, of the floor and the cracks, and I can focus on the tones, and I can focus on the blue of the, of the mat, and I can say all, describe all these things to me, but this is actually, this is actually you know, my mind's kind of just getting busy and rather than just being with the visual field, being with what I'm seeing, I, I'm busy describing it and talking to myself, even if it's like little thoughts, little, little words. And that's what we're trying to, trying to let go of in, in that practice. So, um, there's a, here's a story. I like this story. Um, according to one story, while the Buddha was practicing meditation under the Bodhi tree, His friends experimented on him by putting straws into his ears and up his nose, trying to figure out whether he was a statue or a human being. When they got no reaction from him, they thought he was mad. That is the idea, except not as extreme. 
I don't think that anyone is likely to put <laughs> put anybody is anybody is likely to stick any straws up your nose. <laughs> um, but I think that the idea there, right, is is we're trying to sit and we're trying to experience what's going on and and not necessarily react habitually to it, right? And part of our habitual reactions is to just single things out and think about them. So we're, that's a, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Meditation practice is a question of having some kind of trust rather than trying to achieve an ideal state of mind that will make you okay. Your awareness of your clothing whether it is heavy or light, your sensations of hot or cold, your awareness of your feet, your socks, your collar, your gomden, and the joints of your body can all be worked with. When your perceptions begin to relax, you can learn how to just be. You could regard visual and auditory attention as thoughts, as the thinking process. And that's sort of what we're talking about. In meditation practice, so the next, the next thing he talks about is pain. Uh, in meditation practice, there are two levels of pain, psychological pain, physical pain, sorry, psychological physical pain and actual physical pain. In the first level, psychological pain has been translated into physical pain. It feels physically unbearable because it is psychologically unbearable. The second level is actual physical pain. And when I read that, I was like, oh, it's psychological. Like, why not just call it psychological pain? And I don't know if that occurs to you, but, it, but I think if you think about the way that we experience psychological pain, psychological pain, like discomfort, whatever that is, anxiety, fear, anger, what are, all these negative uh, things that we experience, we experience those in a physical kind of way, Right? If you've ever been, you know, if you've ever been really upset about something, something really that, that really hurts you or that you felt really bad about it, you feel it in your, you can feel it in your body, maybe in your stomach, right? If, you, if you've ever had a, like a, the end of a relationship, right? Like somebody breaks up with you or like a, you know, a, 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 or, or a, a relationship, maybe somebody dies, whatever that is. It's something that you experience, right? You experience it in a, as a physical sensation in your chest or in your, or in your belly, you know, or in your head. You know, it's not just the thoughts. It's not just pain. Psychological pain is not just thinking about things, right? We actually experience psychological pain in, as physical manifestations. So I think that's what he's talking about when he's talking about psychological pain that manifests physically. So there's two kinds of pain that we work with when we sit. There's that kind of psychological pain, and then there's physical pain, like I'm sitting cross-legged for 40 minutes in a row and my knee starts to hurt. That's physical pain, right? It may not be upsetting to me uh, very much in my mind, but it's something that I need to address. And one of the things is, right, when we have, these, when we have pain, physical pain especially, well, if, you're, if your knee hurts because you've been sitting too long cross-legged, uncross your legs. Right? It's pretty, pretty easy, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, we're not trying to sit here and prove to anybody how, how amazing we are at not moving and how we can sit in full lotus or anything like that. We're just trying to sit and work with our, our, our minds. And so with the, with the psychological kind of pain, that's the kind of pain that he suggests that we, we, we work with a little bit. Right? So if you're, having, if you're experiencing a psychological distress, psychological discomfort, he says this is, it's sort of hard-nosed. Um, so where is, the, where is this? Um, He actually talks a little bit about it a little bit later, but he says shamatha practice is a little is a bit hard nosed. If you're experiencing sadness, or you're experiencing anger, or experiencing something uncomfortable, you sit with it. It's a little different than if you're sitting with physical pain. You don't have to just sit with that. Um, he does say be generous with yourself, but not too generous, right? Which is uh, I think that 
both for, for both, especially with physical pain, you know, if you're if you're actually, you know, if you have some discomfort, like right now, I've, my posture has been a little bad, and I got a little bit of discomfort in my in my lower back. Now, if I'm sitting in a bad posture, I could eat very easily, get up and uh, and like be like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I got to give myself a break, or I could just adjust my posture and continue sitting. So. I think that's a little bit what he's talking about. If it's discomfort, if it's not, if it's not going to, you know, mess up my back, then I'm just kind of continue to sit with it. When it comes to the physical pain. Um, let me keep going. So he talks about drowsiness as another kind of pain, or a problem, I should say. Um, if your activity level has been hectic, and suddenly you bring yourself down to a simple activity such as sitting which gives you temporary rest, it can also lead to drowsiness. And I think that's, to me, is a very good example of like, I don't know about you guys, but in my life in New York, I run around, I'm very busy all day. If I take 15, 20 minutes and I sit down sort of in the afternoon um, or in the evening a lot of times, I just start falling asleep. I just, it's very hard to stay awake, right? So posture again, right, starts to, starts to mirror our minds because I'll be like, you know, and I think that, um, you know, the a couple, a couple things. One is, right, we, we often suggest that a meditation practice is best done in the morning. And I think part of that is very practical. It's just easier to sit in the morning when you're awake. You know, um, if you start feeling tired, uh, one of the things you can do is try to open your eyes a little bit more. Right. Um, if you if you lift your gaze, this is sort of a technique that allows you to kind of feel a little more awake, both literally and figuratively, um, but particularly literally. Uh, the other thing is too, if if you are sitting and you're trying, you're falling asleep, you know, and you're really fighting it, maybe you should take a nap, <laughs> you know, and then sit once you once you've taken the nap. I don't know if our lives always allow for that. And sometimes we're sitting in, you know, in, in a group of people or at a retreat and you might feel weird about just lying down and taking a nap in the middle of it. But, but I, think, I think those are ways to deal with drowsiness. And the other way is just sit with it like anything else. But, um, tightness, frozen. So, so he talks about tightness. Uh, tightness is, I think, I, I sort of read this as like, we sit, you know, if you've ever sat there, and especially in the beginning when you're learning to meditate, you like sit, and you're like, okay, this is my posture, I'm just gonna hold it. And you're like, I'm gonna really hold it. I'm not gonna move, <laughs> you know? And, and I think this kind of, that kind of what he's, that kind of tightness is, uh, unnecessary and not necessarily helpful because then suddenly your your focus is on not moving rather than being present rather than working with the breath rather than uh, being aware of what's going on right so that's that's another obstacle he comes up with eye strain he talks about eye strain if you close your eyes when you sit it becomes like switching on to meditation if you close your eyes when you sit it becomes like switching on to meditation when, you're, uh, when you shut your eyes, then switching it off when you open them again. There's too much contrast between meditating and not meditating, which is not particularly re recommended. This is, you know, th this is an interesting thing, and I, I don't know how many of you guys have, have uh, studied traditions where there's, they, they tell you to close your eyes. Um, and certainly there's all kinds of very valid meditation practices and all different kinds of traditions. But one of the things that constantly amazes me about, about the idea that we should be meditating with our eyes closed is that if we're trying to wake up, right, if we're trying to be aware, if we're trying to, to experience the present, keeping your eyes open, I feel like, is a big part of it. It's like a one-sixth, you know, of, of what we could experience or, or more, right? We're very visually focused. Uh, in as human beings, we're like we experience the world visually, it's a very big part of it, and and um, so I I think he's sort of pointing that out here, and also talking a little bit about why this practice of this shamatha vipassana hybrid, this mindfulness awareness meditation, is is uh, you know is an eye open practice. 
So, um, trance. He says trance. We're not. This is not a trance-like state. If you think, you, if you feel like you're going into a trance-like state, then just notice that that's another experience and bring your attention back to the breath and back to the present. Ringing in the ears. He talks about tinnitus. I thought this was really interesting. You guys all know what tinnitus is, right? Like, I have tinnitus a little bit, like because I played rock music for a long time, went to a lot of concerts, so I have a constant ringing in my ears. But like, but it's one of those things that you can kind of focus on and obsess over. So if you start noticing the ringing in your ears, let that go, bring your attention back to the breath and back to the present. Try and maybe incorporate the ringing in your ears into, hearing, into the rest of your hearing as well. Don't focus on the instrument of the symphony, just experience the, the symphony, if that makes any sense. So, um, suggestions. So he has suggestions responding to art articles. I'm sorry, obstacles. Taking a fresh start. When you have difficulty with the constant interruptions that occur in following your breath, you could mentally take a break. Um, he goes on to say, start fresh. Starting fresh give, means coming back to your posture to your awareness of your head and shoulders, then going back to the breath. Practice is very simple as long as you keep your posture, but it's hard to do. And this is where he says, shamatha practice is very hard-nosed. When you cry, you should keep your posture. When you laugh, you should sit with your laughter. Awareness takes hard work. You need a careful, ambitious approach to trying to work with yourself to the point that you are becoming aware every moment. There's no other way. If you are not careful, this is neither the body's problem nor the breathing's problem. You have not sufficiently registered the idea of awareness in your head, so you drifted away. The idea of awareness has to become almost dogmatic. In a one-hour sitting practice, you have to pull yourself back at least 60 times. That's a lot of times. That takes programming, almost computerizing yourself. You have got to come back. And then one of the last things he says, and I love this. I think this is like the best line, one of the best lines from this book, actually, so far anyway. You are not sitting to accomplish something. You are sitting to understand something. And I think that's so important. We always talk about how we talk about how, you know, how we're not trying to accomplish things, right? Like if we, one of the issues is we can sit down and we can start trying to we'll sit down. And I'm going to be the best meditator around. I am going to meditate the shit out of them today. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to crush a 40 minute meditation in 20 minutes. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't think many people actually say that to themselves, but, I, but it, you, you understand what I'm saying, right? And, and this, this statement is just, it's just so good. We are, you are not sitting to accomplish something. You are sitting to understand something. That is huge. That is important to remember. And it also, if you remember it, it makes, it makes the practice a little bit easier. Right? It makes the practice a little more genuine. When you stop trying to accomplish, I'm going to be really present with my, my hearing right now. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be really present with my breath when you kind of relax that a little bit and you realize that the reason that you're sitting is to, to understand the present a little bit better. It's, and everything that's in the present, including ourselves, including our minds, including our bodies, including our breathing, including the sound, that's what we're doing. You know? And everything else kind of gets in the way of that practice. It's sort of... They're very insidious, right? Like our thoughts, we're like, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to focus on my hearing, just like we just did. And, and that can be, you know, they can all kind of get in the way. They can all present like, oh, I was just present with my hearing. That was great. I really was like, full of, like present with my hearing. And the moment you start saying that to yourself, congratulating yourself or, or, or describing what you're aspiring to do is the moment that you stop being present, right? The moment you stop experiencing things. Um, I like to say, too, it's like letting go of your agendas, right? 
that lack, like letting go of your ambitions is the same of letting go of whatever agendas you have as you sit down and just being present. He says, to accomplish something, you have to push to crank up your machine. You drive fast, talk fast, accomplish fast. However, if you're trying to understand something, pushing doesn't help, right? And like I, I, when I read that, I think about like us like when we're kids, right? Or as a kid or as a frustrated adult, right? Something that like you, you ever try to figure out like Ikea furniture, <laughs> right? If you ever try to put together some Ikea furniture, pushing doesn't really usually help. In fact, pushing usually breaks it, right? I mean, what helps is not getting frustrated, not pushing, but actually just relaxing, opening, and like looking at what is right in front of you. And I think that's, again, to his point. We're trying to understand something, and understanding doesn't come by, by like struggle so much. It comes with openness. The last thing he talks about is exertion and humor. Um, but particularly with humor, I think that that's, you know, the, all that stuff that we're just talking about with, with, with you know, ambition and, and pushing and that, that kind of stuff relaxes when you have a little bit more of a sense of humor about what you're doing. When you're a little more gentle with yourself and you're not like, I've got to be a better meditator. You know, I've got to be present more often. Man, it's just... This sucks. I just can't be present right today, you know? Um, if you're able to just say, yeah, you know, take it a little lighter, it's, it can be very helpful. Say, so, yeah, all right, well, I wasn't present just then, but let me just let go of what I'm worried about, bring my attention back. So, so with that, how are we doing? Uh, what I would love to uh, do is hear from any of you um, any one, any problems, obstacles that were not, you know, that you've experienced in your meditation practice, uh, either in the past, or I think if you find yourself coming up with obstacles in your meditation now, I would love to hear them and either hear what you, what you do with them, um, or you can certainly ask questions or maybe I can suggest or, or people here can suggest ways to work with the problems that you have. Yeah, we have a mic too. Well, the the last point, is, as you said, is very important about um, about dropping an agenda and not being intent on uh, figuring something out. Basically, and you've probably heard this that the Tibetan word for meditation, gom, means to become familiar with. Mm. So that's what essentially we're doing. We're becoming familiar with what makes us tick, no matter what it is. And that's a big relief. You know, that takes away a lot of the intensity, a lot of that drive that we may have brought to the cushion from other aspects of our life. Mm -hmm. And then just briefly going back to what you said in the beginning, I don't quite remember the words that were used. Something like, um, we're not being devoted to the practice, but to ourselves. I don't think he used the word devoted. Uh, Do you remember? Com commitment. Commitment, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, yeah, that, uh, commitment Committing to, to the practice. To, yeah, yeah, commitment to myself. And that, that seems to tie in for me with the, uh, with the notion of what is my motivation? You know, why do this? And it's always good to, to remind myself, I'm doing this so I could learn about myself without any, um, with that putting any conditions on it. You know, whatever appears, appears. Which, which kind of leads into being able to ap appreciate myself. And that gets into a, you know, broadens out into 
the Mahayana, you might say, but being able to appreciate other people because they're going through the same thing. So reminding ourselves, I think that's what is meant by um, having a commitment to yourself, that there's something very, well, noble <laughs> about this undertaking. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love to share my experience about meditation a little bit. So uh, when I am sit to practice, uh, the first thing I do is to allow my mind to rest, because it's like it's like your body when it's when it gets very tired after workout or after um, too much walking, you know. And when you lay down on, on the bed or a couch or whatever, and you feel like rested and like um, very comfortable, right? So for them, for me, it's the same with your mind because through all through all the day, you're like your mind is so busy and it's it's all the time thinking about something, and then you you just sit sit down and allow your mind to to relax finally. And it's it's so great that you you feel like connected and finally like you, you just you just relax and you rest. But the problem then <laughs> is that it doesn't uh, last long because you know like thoughts arrive and then it comes all over again. But then you remind yourself that you have to rest. Your mind has to rest, and that's the only time when I really feel that I'm like. I'm meditating, or I feel connected, or this is great for me, and it helps. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. I really like the concept, the idea that meditation is learning to relax into the present, right? And and because it's it's a, it really is, right? It's a relaxation. It's an opening, and as we relax, we're more able to experience the present, and it's relaxing the mind as well as the body, yeah. Hmm. For sure. Um, something really amazing happened uh, in the world in the last couple of weeks when we saw the Thai soccer students hmm. that were in the cave with their soccer coach. And I think the whole attention of the world was with them and first of all, the miracle that they were even found, and then the, that they were still alive after all those days in the co in the in the um, cave in the darkness. And what came to light, and there was a photograph of the the boys meditating in the cave, because their coach had been a. Uh, in Thailand, you know, it's a Buddhist country, and he had been a monk, a Buddhist monk, and so he was very familiar with meditation practice, and what he did was he taught these kids how to meditate in a very, under very stressful, horrific conditions, and I think that um, even in the New York, one of my friends called me up and read the New York Times article about how they described the meditation, or what these boys were doing, and they even showed a photograph of the boys meditating. And I think that was the first time that people in the world really connected to the fact that this was a practice that kept them alive. Because instead of going into a very fearful, uh, anxious state, it kept them relaxed and calm. And I think it was a, a pretty amazing uh, statement about how meditation really works. You know, how, how precious it is to um, use that in our, in our lives. I will say, you know, one one thing that uh, you didn't touch on exactly in that chapter, but I think is is very commonly acknowledged as maybe the biggest obstacle to having a meditation practice is actually just sitting down and doing the practice, right? 
all the other working with your mind, all the other stuff that sort of comes, but like actually sitting down and meditating, getting your butt on the cushion, as they say, is is one of the yeah, is certainly it, an obstacle that I've experienced. Yeah, but what I'm saying about obviously in a normal day to day life, the well, first thing that Trungpa Rinpoche always said was that you have to the night before you have to schedule in your practice for the next day. Don't leave it hanging in the air about when you might be doing it. So you schedule your day, and then within that schedule, you schedule your practice. So as normal human beings living in a city, uh, wherever we live, it's hard enough to practice under normal conditions. But practice really comes into play when we have stress, because then uh, we're so frightened or afraid or anxious or whatever it is, then that's the time to really apply the practice, to apply the technique of you know, meditation, to um, not to give up on practice when things are getting rough. But what, what you so showed with these kids in the cave, not to belabor it, was these are children that really didn't know anything. I don't know if they knew anything about meditation, but it was their coach who had been a monk, and he was a Theravadan monk, and they really emphasized meditation in the Theravadan tradition. And he applied the antidote to the stressful situation by, first of all, he was in charge of these kids, and he was, I'm sure, completely freaked out about what he was going to do, and probably all the guilt that he felt that he even took them Batteries are dying. But in spite of all of that, he still had the mindfulness of applying the antidote that he learned as a monk, which was practice. And he taught his kids to meditate. And that really helped them. So this was a very unusual, and they were sitting in the dark. I mean, it's such, it's really like a miracle. Does anybody else have any 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 pro like obstacles in meditation that room? Uh, yeah, I guess if we it may work for a moment if you try and turn it back on. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Anyway, so um, I just wanted to thank you for you know your talk tonight, and uh, it was very thorough, and I got a lot out of it. Um, I love what was said about um, commitment earlier. I uh, was taught over the years at some point um, to ask myself three questions before I start my practice. The first one is, um, why am I doing it? The second one is, uh, what kind of mind do I have this morning? Because I do it in the morning. And then the third is, will I commit to the practice? It's a simple like, yes, usually. <laughs> um, so that helps me kind of with uh, aspiration, I guess. Um, I love what you said about the symphony thing. The symphony, uh, as opposed to focusing on the instrument. Um, there's times where I'm, you know, using all my senses, and of course, like like you said, um, this visual, but also auditory are pretty strong. And um, you know, it's a fine line between what I'm hearing and when I'm like labeling what I'm hearing, and and you know, it's it's like almost a skanda, right? Like uh, one of those skandhas where you start putting labels on things. Um, it's hard to catch that moment. Uh, but um, the thing that, that has always been a little slippery for me is the not too tight, not too loose thing. You know, he uses words in there like discipline and ambition or, um, and you know, I've, I've heard different instructions around this idea that, you know, once you're aware, that's all you need to do. You know, um, that's it. And, uh, but there's also an element of exertion i feel like that's necessary and that's always been like challenging like there'll be times where i'll sit there for you know 20 minutes and like the 
the thing rings, and I'm like, I laugh because I was thinking the entire time, <laughs> you know. So um, I guess that's always like tricky for me uh, to find that balance. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two things. One, you know, he, he when he talks about how in an hour of meditation you have to come back 60 times, you know, uh, which I've got to say, if I've sat for an hour, I probably don't come back. I don't know if I come back 60 times. I'm sure there are minutes, minutes, many minutes pass in certain cases where I'm just lost in thought and, you know, but, um, but I think that, I think that the, the main thing, right, is, is that we, we talk about the middle path a lot, right? And uh, it's true of our practices too. We, we want to have discipline and we want to have um, a commitment, but we don't want that we don't want the practice to become about that discipline. We don't want, it's not about the discipline itself. It's not actually about like showing commitment. It's actually about just doing the practice. And, and if we use, you know, and that's all right. I feel like that it's almost like a light touch, like the same way we do like a light touch with our breath. We kind of want to do a light touch with commitment, a light touch with practice. We want to, with, with, with the exertion, we want to sp spend the time and the energy. We want to have discipline but not to the point where that becomes the focus, right? The focus is always going to be on that, on the practice itself, on actually doing the meditation, you know? And, and it can be a, I feel like it can be a, a pitfall if we get too focused on, oh, well, my posture's got to be just right, you know? And then, then that could be like, in and of itself, sort of like a, uh, an obstacle, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't remember what the five hindrances are, but the two that I do remember, probably because they come up so frequently for me, um, impatience and doubt are, are something, are, are things that I often see in my uh, meditation practice. And that, anyway, maybe it would be good to talk about, you know, those specifically or the hindrances in general. That, does anyone remember what the five hindrances are? The um, doubt and, and impatience. Uh, how, you, how you experience that? Yeah, well, um, it, it, impatience I see connected with um, having expectations about my practice, like the, having impatience about that, want, wanting to see results. And um, often I have doubt when, um, when, I, when I see my mind running amok and I can't do anything about it, that, that, that's when doubt uh, often comes up for me. You know, I mean, I think the, the impatience thing is pretty, falls pretty squarely into the, uh, the ambition that we were talking about before, right? So I think that, that, that when it comes to the impatience, you know, if you're, you know, if you're just sitting, like impatience isn't necessarily you're not necessarily going to experience impatience. When you experience impatience is when you are somehow not satisfied and you're sort of like, if you're not satisfied, you're like, I want to achieve this. I want this from the practice. I want this to happen. I want to see results. And, and that is what's getting, that's, that's the obstacle itself, right? And, and, and really is how do we work with that? I think we work with it the same way we work with, with everything else is trying to recognize that we're having those thoughts. Be like, oh, I'm having a conversation with my head about, about like what I should be getting out of this or what I shouldn't be getting out of this or what's happening for me or what's not happening for me. And whatever that conversation is, you let it go, bring your attention back to the breath and then back to the experience of the present. And I think probably I, I would assume that you probably have had the experience that as you sit, the more and more you sit, you know, there is a, a changing of our experience of those things, our ch a changing relationship to, am to, to the ambition that we bring with us to like why we're sitting and, and stuff like that. Would you, would you say that is true? Uh, that it lessens its, it, it lessens its hold a little bit? Uh, yeah, you gotta hold it. Okay, hello. There you go. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. Um, but 
also, to be entirely honest and humble, um, you know, I'm not 100% there. Um, Neither am I. <laughs> if anybody in the room is 100% there, please let us know. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I think that's important. It's important to realize that, that you know, it's, I, I, you know, the, I love the, the story of Mel Rapa in the cave. You know this story of Mel Repa in the cave. So Mel Repa was uh, meditating in a cave, and he, and as he was meditating, I believe Mel Repa was like drinking a lot of nettle tea, and it turned him green, right? Um, and uh, uh, but while he was meditating in the cave on retreat, uh, a demon came uh, and latched onto his toe. I've heard it said, told different ways, but the demon demon like grabbed onto his toe and just wouldn't let go. It was really like bothering bothering him and distracting him from his practice. And at first. He tried to ignore the demon, and the demon just grabbed it on tighter and, and just became bigger and scarier and meaner. And so then he tried to like force the demon to go away. He's like, go away, like, I don't, you, you're not welcome here. Can't you see I'm trying to attain enlightenment? And, 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 and as he tried to get the demon to go away, you know, ignoring didn't work, trying to get it to go away didn't work. The demon became more bigger and more scary. And finally, he, uh, you know, just gave up and trying to get rid of the demon and and just invited the demon to sit down and have tea with him you know kind of accepted the fact that the demon was latched onto his toe and that's what was going on and the moment that he accepted that he stopped fighting the that demon that was grabbing onto his toe the demon transformed into uh, a, a goddess that helped the, the sort of helping him with his practice and I think the idea there, um, I, I, the idea there is that, you know, these, these things that, you know, we struggle with as we meditate are actually opportunities for us to, to work with ourselves. And the moment we stop seeing these, these, these obstacles as obstacles, they actually become opportunities and teachers. Right. So whatever that is that we struggle with, if it's a if it's an ambition or an impatience, um, you know, that that in and of itself is really an opportunity for us to see what we're actually working with. And when we see what we're working with, which maybe maybe that ambition from in my case, for example, might stem from some kind of fear of not being adequate or some kind of fear of not being successful or some kind of fear of not being loved or some kind of fear of suffering in some way because I am not, have not achieved my ambitions. And, and when I go from having that experience of that negative, that ne negative thing, that obstacle, to recognizing it for where, where, what it's really coming from, it kind of turns, it, it changes from from being an obstacle to being like, oh, it's almost like a friend. It's almost like somebody's, uh, uh, an aspect of my mind that's pointing out things to me that I, that I need to become more aware of and more friendly. And it, it transforms in that way. And I think that, that that's, that's kind of, um, that's really what we're working with when we're working with obstacles. And one of the, the things that follows that story is they say, they say, uh, I, I guess, I, I believe as Miller Rapa was saying this, that, you know, um, you, your demons never truly leave. And maybe it was Chogun Trungpa, I don't know, I'm pretty sure I've heard this here. Uh, but they never truly leave, they come back to visit, you know, and have tea <laughs> as time goes on. And I, and I think that's the thing. You know, our ambitions, our insecurities, they come back in different ways, yeah. And sometimes they come back in different ways to teach us. And sometimes they just come back and they poke their head in, say hello, and you say hello. Oh, I see you, you know. And then, and then just go on with with what you're doing, you know. So I think that's a that's like a good way to work with just about anything that we that we run into, you know. Yeah. Uh, along those lines, uh, another way of saying it perhaps is that uh, impatience isn't particularly an obstacle. It's just something that, that comes around every once in a while. And it's something we just get more and more familiar with. Oh, hello again. It's, it's you, my old friend impatience. 
Um, and I, as a, very imp as a very impatient person, tried to work with that. Uh, off the cushion by feeling the impatience in my body uh, and, and trying, you know, f you were re referring to working with emotions earlier, feeling where this impatience is happening. Basically, it's about uh, encouraging myself to relax and take a few breaths. And I like your story about I keep working with the, uh, the challenge of IKEA furniture <laughs> because for me, impatience is connected a, a lot with anger. Mm. So, for example, when you're impatient on the line in the store, you might want to execute the person who's taking too long at the cash register or, you know, just really um, have, a, have a scene, you know, you just, but this is not what's going to happen. So you just have to, you know, calm yourself down and recognize, oh yeah, here I am having an impatient fit again. And just briefly, your story about holding your posture if you're laughing or crying, um, this has happened a number of times at long re meditation retreats, mm -hmm. and I'm sure all of you uh, veterans have experienced at a week or month-long meditation retreat at some point because you become so sensitized to what's going on. Well, I was thinking of laughter. Some, some person, there may be a titter in the room somewhere, and then it'll be infectious, and at a certain point, you know, half half the people, like you'll have about 10 or 15 people there, just laughing, but keeping their posture. And somehow it, it becomes so joyous that way. <laughs> There's something about really embracing that emotion and just letting it be there. And you were t saying about crying? Yeah, crying when you, when you think that you can't do it anymore and you're still sitting there and practicing. And after a while, it, it becomes like tolerable, you, you know? You're still there and uh, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I, I just think too, when, when talking about it, you know, working with emotions and, you know, and I think it sort of, it parallels working with thoughts in the sense that, you know, the goal is not to, it's not to suppress thought. It's not to suppress emotion. It's actually to allow these things to sort of occur. Like we're, we're not, we're, we're trying to sit with them, not repress them, right? That's sort of an important distinction. And it works both for thought and for emotion. You know, we're trying to experience them actually, especially the emotions. Today, today is uh, is this on? Is this yeah, on? Yeah, it's on. Today is a very sacred day because it's the first. The this when the Buddha two thousand five hundred years ago first turned the wheel of Dharma. The first turning of the wheel when he first taught after he attained enlightenment. And it's a multiplier day, so whatever you do today multiplies a thousand times. So it's nice that we have our Dharma talk tonight. But in any case, even though the Buddha practiced for seven years with all the ups and downs, the night before he attained enlightenment, Mara, who's this, the god of the chaos or whatever, was very annoyed that the Buddha was about to attain enlightenment. So he sent his daughters to come and distract him. And um, everybody thinks, oh, the Buddha just attained enlightenment. But even till the very last moment, there was this great obstacle that he had to then also relate to. And it didn't distract him at all. He just kept practicing. Hmm. So right until the very end. Well, with that, that in mind, I think what we should do is dedicate the merit uh, so that it is uh, spread a thousand times. And then we should all go make at least a thousand dollars tonight so that can be <laughs> spread. 
multiplied by a thousand times. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so I'll lead. So before we dedicate the merit, I, I really like to explain this uh, over and over again because sometimes it it's, can be uh, strange to people who don't know what it is saying. But basically what we are doing with, when we dedicate the merit is we are uh, taking the what we have just done, the practice we have just done, the uh, the uh, merit that we have accumulated by practicing and, and coming together and um, uh, with the Dharma, and we are giving that away. We're giving it out to the rest of the world uh, in, in the hopes that everybody will be happier and healthier and attain enlightenment. So with that said, by this merit, may all obtain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing, from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thank you, guys. This is always a, uh, a group effort, so thank you. <laughs>